in September, Hurricane Harvey in Texas, uh, the Sonoma County wildfire, you just feel like we'll leave an issue today. Um, last year, the Erskine fires. We've got a lot of things that have gone on that have prompted us to put on this, this uh, uh, little seminar today. Um, what I want to focus on today, um, we've got a lot of great speakers here. They're going to speak to uh, uh, individual emergency preparedness. And I want to tell you how important that is. Um, First thing I want to do is I want to tell you just a little bit about what, what our role is as law enforcement in a natural disaster. Uh, first and foremost, protect life and property. That is what our primary function is. Um, we're going to initiate and support rescue operations. In addition to that, our primary function is going to be to coordinate and deploy our mutual aid resources. Um, most of you know we have several small police departments up here. In a natural disaster, we are going to rely very heavily on mutual aid resources, okay, from the county um, all over the place, okay. We can very quickly be isolated up here on this mountain. Uh, so I want to emphasize to you is although we have these functions in mind, we may not be able to get to you as quickly as you think we can. All right, we have a lot of other things going on. Uh, so that makes it really critical that you're prepared and you can, you can sustain yourself for your period. I believe, I'll let the experts get to that, but we're talking about up to three days. It could be that long, okay? Uh, encompassed within our initial response, one of the things we really focus on at the, at the onset of a natural disaster is uh, identifying and responding to what we call our critical facilities, okay? Uh, critical facilities uh, consist of building structures or complexes which pose a threat to public safety or most importantly, represent a resource for public and or emergency responders, okay? So we're talking about public utility structures, hospitals, schools, government buildings, airports, uh, and most importantly, I believe up here in our area, are our main transportation arteries, okay? Highway 58, these back roads. Uh, when we're relying upon our mutual aid resources and those arteries are cut off, we don't have a whole lot of response, okay? Uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges, and I don't know if the CERT team or anyone else is gonna get into this, one of our biggest challenges from a public safety standpoint is gonna be communications. Uh, our communication system with here in the county is going to be taxed very heavily, all right? Um, 911 lines may be down. Cell phone systems may be down. And if you are in need of assistance, you may have a difficult time reaching public safety personnel to make that contact and make that request for us to get out there, okay? So again, emphasize the importance of individual preparedness. So uh, again, how can you help? Being prepared is an individual as well as an organizational responsibility. Okay? You're gonna have the ability to recover much quicker if you are prepared to survive on your own for a short period of time. Okay? Um, also, that gives you the ability to help others, to help your neighbors. Uh, statistics indicate in these, in these disasters like this, high percentage of rescues and help don't come from first responders. It actually comes from your neighbors, your friends, your family, okay? Because we do not have the ability to get out and, and, and render assistance and render aid to everyone at the same time. So uh, with that in mind, again, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna be taxed very heavily and the more prepared you are, the more efficiently we can do our job. So we've got a lot of great experts here today. They're gonna to talk to you about what you can do to prepare individually. And as a family, we're gonna talk about probably go packs and uh, family plans for emergencies. And these guys are gonna give you a lot of great information. So uh, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for everybody showing up. I'd like to answer some questions, question and answer, because I wanna know what you guys wanna know. Um, 
besides me just standing. And I know you guys are going to cover a lot of this later. So, uh, my name is Captain Trevor Baldwin. Um, this is going to be 15 years in the department for me. Um, 10 years as a captain, and this is uh, third year I've been up here in Tashby. I don't know if I, maybe I've seen some of you around before. Um, so, basically, emergency preparedness. Um, you know, what what can we do? I want to let you know what the fire department side. Um, as a station personnel, what we're going to do, but also how are we going to help you to prepare um, in case there's an emergency that's beyond the scope of the normal emergencies to day to day. So, um, as far as our department, we have you know 47 stations throughout the county. Tatchby area, we have a temporary station Golden Hills. Here in Tatchby, we have it. Um, Stallion, Bear Valley, Keene. Each of these stations have three personnel on at a time. Most emergencies of fire when we go is nine personnel go to it. That's just one fire. So for one, one type of fire like that, we're going to have to have resources come from Mojave, Rosemond, other areas. That, and I'm just saying this as this is one fire. There are going to be situations we, we are more than capable to handle every emergency that comes about. But there are occasions, and it's going to happen, and today was the Great American Shakeout, where we're, it's going to be beyond the resources that we can handle, at least in the first initial stages. So that's going to be the first 72 hours, and like they're going to talk about later, uh, these ready kits and what you can do. So I want to talk about just if anyone can raise their hand, any type of emergency that you, besides an earthquake, that you think is going to be, that's you're going to need to be prepared for beyond, you know, a normal day. Wildfire. Exactly. And up here is, everyone is aware of that. The Canyon, the West Fire, and our crew has been on both of those. Um, also, two years ago, I just, from social media, you see um, the floods were two years ago in, in there. Most people aren't ready for a flood like that. I know I wasn't, I wasn't as, as a captain, you hear, oh, thunderstorms are coming. That was something I never could imagine seeing. Um, these people that were in their cars, probably 200 cars, um, tour buses, these people aren't, aren't ready for it. But this is what today is about, is getting ready. Your person, in your car, in your home, getting your family ready, um, getting a social network, you know, your neighbors that can check on you when there's an emergency. Um, this is gonna be a community effort anytime there's, um, you know, a flood around that where the resources, not only that we don't have the resources, but that we can't get to you in time. These people, I mean, it was only a 12 hour period, but to be stuck in your car without medications for 12 hours, to not have food, to not have water, to not be able to go to the restroom being stuck in the air. These are things you don't think about just driving home from Lancaster to Tashby. Um, thankfully, we were able to get everyone out quickly. Um, as quick as we can, 12 hours is still a long time being stuck in your car, but it's something to think about. So hopefully today we'll talk about you know ways of preparing a kit in your car, preparing something at home quickly, um, things we can do. Um, just even on a day to day when I'm at home, I think about emergency preparedness of you know just asking my wife, you, would you know how to get out of the get the car out of the house if we had no power. And she's looking at me like, well, I don't know, pull that red button? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know, and those are the kinds of things in your mind, and, and as firefighters, we do this. Every time I drive around town, I see the train go by, and I see the placards on the, the chemical cars. And I look it up, and I see what type of, um, you know, hazards we have when it goes through town. Um, so we pre-plan in our heads what we're gonna do. And this is what citizens need to do on if you're separated from your family, if one of your family members is at the mall and you're at home and we have the, the big earthquake, what are we gonna do? Is some, are we ready? Do we have people out of state that can check on us? Do we have neighbors that can check on us? Um, we have a lot of elderly in Tashby, Bear Valley that are gonna need help. Um, so we are gonna do everything we can as firefighters to help everyone, um, but with three people at one station and five, 10,000 people and in each response area, uh, the earthquake's going to tax our system. Um, so, I, I, are we going to go over Ready Kern and things like that later? Okay, perfect. So, if anyone has any questions, um, yes, sir. Okay, 
I've been a city volunteer fireman, you know, many years ago. Correct. What about when a guy's house burns and catches on fire? They all run outside, they're in their night clothes. You know, that's a local, that's an emergency that you know is going to happen before an earthquake and all of that. Exactly. And everything is inside, and they're standing outside, you try to put the house out. Exactly. And, and, and we, we have things we can do to help them stay warm, to give them help. Um, and, and such as that, but there are, we always think of, okay, the big earthquake's gonna happen, we're all gonna be sleeping in the middle of the night. Well, we don't think about, it could be that snowstorm that we're having at the same time. It could be the middle of summer and it's 100 degrees outside and you know now we're all, no one wants to go inside their house because it's been destroyed or there's a gas leak or, um, so hopefully today we'll get to talk about, I hope you ask a lot of questions, I'll be more than happy to answer as many as I can. Um, <laughs> You know, we can go over utilities, how to shut off certain utilities, and um, what type of hazard and different type of, uh, you know, earthquakes. What we can, what we can do to, you know, save lives, help you. Uh, and be, the main thing I want you to get is being prepared helps you be less nervous. Like me, not being, not not spending the time today to prepare for this <laughs> makes me a little nervous. But. By you being at home, getting your getting things together, already have pre-planned in your head, if something happens now, what am I gonna do? When it happens, you're not as scared. You've already gone over it in your head. You're able to think more clearly, and, and it'll be better for you, your family, your whole community. Um, and it'll give us time to come help you as well. And I'm a CERT team member. David Shaw is our CERT team leader, and I don't know if that was the event that you were referring to, but the, tonight is actually the Golden Hill CSD meeting, and David Shaw is also a Golden Hill CSD member, and so I got a call a couple days ago that you're on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so about not having prepared this. It's like, oh, okay, so I'm gonna be doing this. The things you've been hearing today, Chief, when you were saying things, my husband's like, he's stealing your thunder. He's saying everything you're going to say. <laughs> but it's the same message. We need to hear it over and over again. When my husband and I took our CERT training about three years ago, it was 100% just for myself. I've lived in California. We're both native Californians. I knew I wasn't ready for an earthquake, and I thought, maybe if I go take this training, that'll give me that little motivation I need to come home and do the things that I know I need to do. I really didn't intend to serve in any kind of team be involved in the community, it really wasn't my intention. And I want to stress that by being prepared, by even doing our CERT training, does not mean you're committing yourself or obligating yourself to be part of a team. It means you're just going there to learn for yourself. If you want to become a team member, awesome, we can use your help. But the, the training, the CERT training that we do, and CERT stands for Community Emergency Response Team, doesn't mean you have to be on the team. So I, I want to make sure that I'm clear about that. This training is for you. You as individuals to be prepared because Tashby's is a beautiful little mountain town, but as we all know, we have one way in and out to the west, and we basically have two in and out to the east. If we have a major disaster, what we've been taught to is three days, plan on it. These guys cannot get to all of us. They are not going to be able to. We have to be able to take care of ourselves. And throughout the training, I kept, they'd stop. Right in the middle, it was 20 hours of training, eight hours, eight hours, and then a four hour Saturday, they'd stop and say, who's number one? You are, and I have to say, I am, I am. Because, we can become excited and rush into situations as civilians, because I am a civilian, to help and become a victim myself. And so now I'm just one more person that's gonna need some help. So I was constantly reminded to not overestimate my abilities, know what I'm capable of doing, follow the chain of command. There are people, and the Kern County Fire Department is actually our sponsoring agency. Kurt is under, CERT is under FEMA, or part of FEMA, and there's CERT teams all over the country. But there's a sponsoring agency. In our case, the Tatchby CERT is under the Kern County Fire Department. I do not do anything with CERT as a CERT member unless I've been activated. I get a call from my team leader because the fire department has contacted and said, hey, we need some help. Uh, the Erskine fire was mentioned last year. Again, I'm a volunteer. So when they called and said, hey, we've been activated, it doesn't mean I have to drop everything and go. My husband couldn't go, but I went. And I took my son, who's also been CERT trained showed up at the school and said, where do you want me, where do you need me? I may think I know what I want to do and where I want to go and where I want to be of service, but no, I have to go where I'm, where I'm sent. In that particular case, I was sent over to help at, at some of the donation centers. I, mean, I wasn't fighting fires or rescuing anybody. This, it was to help at the donation centers. So Chris has brought up some images here. This is the Tubbs fire up north in Sonoma County. This could be here. This could be here as quickly. These people had really 
very little time to get out of their homes. They had time to grab a few things and go. And one of the things I have here, I didn't print enough for everybody. For one thing, I hate paper. It's such a waste. All this information is available. If I can get it for you, also attach me cert.org if you're interested in more about learning about cert or more FEMA. It's, are you ready? These are the checklists we were talking about. I have a bag in my car because I come home just from school down in Bakersfield and then stuck in an accident. You know, you leave thinking, oh, it's only 30 minutes, I'll be home. I'm, I'm hungry, but I'm going to be home, I'll eat when I get home. I have nothing in my car but breath mints, and I'm stuck on the freeway for three hours. One of our CERT team leaders was actually stuck. He was coming home from Mojave during the flood, the mudslides really is what it was two years ago. Coming home, didn't have a cert bag, didn't have his go bag with him in his car. He was on Oak Creek just in time to see, did I just see a car just wash and go into the wash? He was in a high spot. So he got up and whoa, the low spot, sure enough there was a car, high patrol came up, said turn around and go out. They couldn't, they were stuck in this high spot for a while. Safe, he wasn't hurt, but he said, I had half a bottle of water and an apple in my car. No jackets, no shoes to walk out, nothing. Again, it's not about being paranoid. A lot of people are like, oh, you're just being paranoid. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be paranoid. It's not about being paranoid. It's about being prepared. Because when you're prepared, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. You got your bag. You have your things ready. You know how to shut off your gas. LA County, our department will probably tell you this thing because I'm in real estate too. Natural or um, automatic shutoffs on your natural gas lines are required when you sell a house. You have to have that. Kern County, we don't have that. That means you have to know how to shut off your gas. You may not be able to even get a hold of the gas company. No one else may be able to come and help you. So with CERT, I'm trained to keep my, keep my own house in order, be prepared. Then, once I've checked with the house, everybody's okay, everyone's okay, then I go check on my neighbors. Then I check in, even maybe a little farther down, and then I, you know, my team leader is called, which are that, that trailer out Southern County, or excuse me, at the uh, CSD, the Golden Hill CSD. I try to get over there. That's our plan is we will get there and we will station from that location and then be sent out. Sometimes, who knows, we may not be able to get there. But we'll do our best and one of the main things that Jeannie, we were talking about outside was triage, which I am not a medical person. I'm not trained to do it, give any kind, some very basic first aid. But I can at least assess you. How, how hurt are you? Are you, yeah, you have a broken arm, it hurts, but you can wait. She's bleeding, she needs help immediately. So when emergency personnel do show up, we can send them right to the people who need help. Time, no more time is lost in that whole whole effort of what's going on. Jeannie was part of our CERT team. She, she still is, she is. I'm gonna let her speak a little bit about what she's doing. And working to make sure we all get the same level of training, we all get the same level of equipment. Our uh, department also assists in getting them equipment such as a trailer and the equipment inside the trailer through grants from FEMA and from the state OES, our Office of Emergency Services. I use an acronym, SMAC. <laughs> Bad habit. I guess David today. There was one you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. So everything she said, spot on. And I'm going to add just a little bit to that. CERT came about because in the uh, 85 earthquakes in Mexico City, very devastating earthquake. LA City Fire went down with their urban search and rescue team. And they saw like 700 rescues being done by plain citizens. People who just happened to be there who wanted to help. That was fantastic. They lost a hundred of those people to death and serious injury because they were not trained. They didn't know how to safely do these things. As Sarah says, you're number one. You got to take care of your safety first because if you're hurt, you're now someone else who is added to the victim list. And you don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that helped. So, CERT gives you these skills so that we can take up that gap time after a devastating event and then be that gap filler for our professional emergency responders. We have a standardized training. Uh, FEMA has vetted this throughout the country. We're allowed to add to it and personalize it for our area. For example, we don't teach the parts about hurricanes. Not really a problem here. <laughs> so we make sure we have a lot more about wildfire and about earthquakes. We put a thing about how to deal with propane tanks because evidently nobody on the East Coast uses propane. No problem. We got this covered. So 
This training is available to everybody, and I do mean everybody, whatever your ability is. I have had people who are 94 in my class. She's not going to go crawling around doing search and rescue, but she is an excellent scribe. She is really good at knowing who's where. And that's just as important because while we're number one, we're also looking out for our team so that we can continue to be that force multiplier for professionals. The other reason why we have the standardized training and a fairly strict structure for our, our command is so that when the professionals do show up and we hand them our reports, they know what's going on. We're speaking the same language they are, we're using the same terminology, we're using the same structure, and they can have confidence in what we hand them. So they don't have to redo this work. They can start at a higher level when they show up at an area. They don't have to start from, okay, what do we got here? We can hand it to them and say, this is what we have. This is what we've seen. This is what we've done. These are the issues that we have seen that you might want to address. And then they can make their decisions from there. We don't do heavily damaged buildings. We don't do hazmat. We don't do anything with a placard over, you know, the, that you're talking about the placards. Nothing that is in that book. We are the support staff, if you must, for the professionals. We are not going to do anything that's going to endanger. And if Sarah shows up and I said, okay, this is what I've got for you, she can go, you know what? I am not comfortable with that. That's fine. I'll find another place for it. There is a job for everybody. The other thing that SIR is doing, and, and I'm really pushing, is we're trying to reach out to our other volunteer partnerships. Uh, this summer, we did a traffic, Chief Martha and I did a traffic and control management class. We invited our volunteers and police service, because very often, there's a handful of us, there's a handful of them, and a job to do. And we need to be able to speak that same language and work together. I'm getting ready to work with Red Cross on the installations of the smoke detectors around the county. We've done that here in Tehachapi and I'm trying to get my other teams to do that around the county. <coughs> we're also looking at possibly, no, not possibly, we're looking at doing a teen cert program here in the high school. Trees is going to be helping. She's my, my teen cert specialist. <coughs> and then I was just was speaking with the superintendent of schools in the county so that we can get our youth involved in this. If you do nothing else but take the CERT class and go, you know what, I'm good. I got myself. I got my family. We are thrilled. We are happy. We are jazzed. That is one less person that's going to need our help. And you may decide at that time, we're good. You know what, I can come help. That's fine too. We know who you are. We know your level of training. We can work with you on that too. This is a class. Yes, it's 20 hours. I can guarantee you my class is yes. <laughs> so much fun. We laughed. Just finishing actually just finishing classes this Monday, last one of my last classes. But we're also looking at serious stuff, scary stuff. You know, we're talking about catastrophic. On the other hand, there is so much to do between now and that event. There's so many other places where we can help out. We help out at the parades, the, with the Mountain Festival Mount Parade. Grand we do Grand Fonda, we do Challenge of the Bear. Anytime you need staff, uh, I've done the um, Thunder on the Mountain, helping drive, direct all those cars. Anytime you need help, we can help you with these kinds of things. And so we always try to push out to our other charities. Tatchby's got some amazing people <coughs> here who are really mind, uh, service minded. We can help with that as well because we're another force multiplier. And this is just reinforcing our team structure, our command structure, and it, everything you do is learning. So today I think we're going to talk about some of the practical things. Um, the other uh, people have talked about being prepared. That's the big thing. You've got to be prepared. So how do we do that? Um, I think uh, the American Red Cross really is uh, best described by our mission statement. The American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the powers of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Now, we do have a lot of volunteers. Where are our volunteers now? Up north in the fires. Houston, Puerto Rico, Florida, 
Mexico. We're all over the world. We have thousands of people in each one of those locations that are helping the people. So what does the Red Cross do? Okay, uh, some of our services, biomedical, everybody knows with the blood. Um, international dealing with uh, vaccinations. Services to the armed forces. Does anybody have any armed people in the armed forces that are overseas now? Nobody. Here's kind of an important thing. The uh, Red Cross, if you have somebody that's uh, deployed overseas or whatever, and if they say there's a problem here in the U.S. and whatever, if you want to get in contact with that person, you contact the Red Cross. Red Cross has a, a direct link to the State Department, can then contact that person that's overseas, and usually we'll make arrangements to have that person sent back home in two or three days. So if you ever have somebody deployed overseas, contact the Red Cross. Um, health and safety, CPR, first aid, uh, lifeguard training. What we're going to talk about today is, again, the disaster cycle <coughs> services. This is what everybody here. Next one. So where we are, disaster cycle services, prepare, respond, and recover. Prepare, right? We're going to have to prepare for these disasters. What we're going to talk a bit about today. We're in a phase of respond, okay? We're there with the Red Cross right now in a lot of those disasters and in recovery. How are we helping them to recover? Let's talk about the preparation stage. Okay, does this look familiar? Yeah. Katrina, right? Yeah. Boy, what are we suffering now in Houston now with all those people? Look at Florida and look at uh, Puerto Rico. It looks pretty familiar. Um, no, back. Um, what happened is uh, we have the earthquake. Wow, Mexico, amazing. Uh, tsunami and of course, house fires. Um, what do you think is the most uh, prevalent disaster that we see in the U.S. over the past, let's say, five years? Of any one of these things, what do we have by far have the most of? Fires. Fires, exactly. We have by far so many more fires than we respond to than anything else. And uh, what we see in the, um, in the United States, there's at least seven deaths per day in the United States due to fires. It's amazing. So how do you prepare for something like that? Okay, next one. Again, the Red Cross responds. Uh, usually if there's a fire here in Bakersfield, uh, we get a call from the fire department that says, hey, we have a family that's been displaced. We are on call 24-7. We will go to wherever that house is. That's, uh, where the people are usually out there on the street, children, whatever. They're cold. They don't know where to go. And then the Red Cross will respond by giving them blankets. We'll also uh, talk to them and we'll also give them monies or vouchers so they can get a room and food and lodging for three days until we can get them back on their feet. So we respond 24-7. I think we might, we're averaging almost like a fire a day to respond to in Bakersfield. That's awesome. Okay, next one. Okay, have you planned for this? This is very interesting, right? Delay in health. Everyone talked about that the first responders are not going to be able to get to you in two or three days. So what do you do in two or three days, right? We saw that in Houston, we saw it in Florida, we saw it in Mexico, everything. So you have to remember, delay in health. So you're going to have to have things available to you for three days to survive. What are the three things you need, basic? Water, food, and what? Medication, right? That's what the people need. If you could have those things, you could probably survive for one or two or three days until the responders could get to you. Power outages. Wow, have we ever heard of the power outages? Look at Puerto Rico, right? Now, can you go to the ATM and get money out if you have the power off? No, can't. What about getting gas? Can you get gas if the power is out? Right? So you can't get gas, you can't get cash, you can't get in, you can't do much of anything, right? So you have to consider that. So you better have some light and batteries. Road closures, oh my gosh, have we seen that? From the fires, right? Roads are closed, or with all the flooding, oh my gosh, you can't drive down this road, I gotta go some other place. Property damage, oh my goodness. Look at what happens in all of these places. How many homes have been destroyed, right? So what are you gonna have to consider? Where are you gonna go, right? I have no place to go back to. We've opened up the evacuation centers. People go there, or they go stay in the hotel, or they go stay with friends. That's a big issue. Clean water, oh my gosh. Clean water. We're constantly moving water around. With the fire departments, everybody's moving water around. We're flying in water. How much water do you think you, each person consumes in one day? No. Any idea? A gallon? Yeah, yeah roughly about a gallon. Now we're talking drinking, we're not talking flushing and all the other yeah, things. Yeah, we're talking water. just drinking water. 
right? A gallon a day. So can you imagine in some of these places that have five to 10,000 people, how much water you need every day? That's why you see them constantly moving water, right? Because they need a lot of water. Suppose you didn't have any bottled water at home. There's a fire, you gotta leave, you need, you need water. Where are you gonna get your water? Water. Where would you go? The water toilet. heater, if you don't have a... The water heater, exactly. There's a lot of water in the water heater, right? The toilet. And we're, yeah, wow, you go to the toilet, right? <laughs> now, you can go to either place, right? The, the sink or whatever, but yeah, I go to the toilet. So if you need water, those are two good places to go to. Or if you have a water bed, or if you have a jacuzzi. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know, how many people have a jacuzzi or water bed here? I don't. Good point. Um, okay, living in a shelter. Everybody's used to living in their house, right? But we've opened up a lot of shelters, right? So you're gonna to have to plan on, okay, if I can't live in my house, I'm gonna go live in a shelter. Some of those people may be there for what? One week, two weeks, two months, three months, right? So you gotta be very mentally and also with some of the stuff that you need to live in the shelter. Uh, limited or no communications, oh my gosh. Have we seen that before? What's the first thing that goes out on these uh, if like in the fires or whatever, what happened? Cell, phone. cell towers went out, right? So how do you communicate? I'm gonna ask the fire department, how do you communicate if you don't have the cell towers? If we don't have the cell towers, right. the, we have our radios. Right, they have the radios, right? That's right. Hey, Facebook was the only way the first fire shop we were able to get hold they were able to communicate through Facebook. Right, through Facebook, Facebook, or what do we see with the news people? What have they been using? They've been going around with satellite telephones, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We did this a lot. I worked in um, in Africa for 20 years. Back with anything else, we always use the satellite uh, uh, phones. They work great. Yeah. yeah. Ham radio as well. Amateur radio. Ham radio is another good point, right? Big so, part of emergency. So that's a real problem with the communications, right? Besides getting the people there, how do you tell them to get there, right? So a very important thing: limit or no communication. Next one? Okay, so we can be ready. But how do we get ready? Next one. Okay, be red cross ready is what did we talk about? Get a kit. You gotta make a kit available. Next one. Okay, what's the first thing you should have in your kit? This is just essential. I have this in my car all the time. What? Water, right? Mm -hmm. Food, first aid kit, and medication. It's basic. You should have that in your kit all the time. Next one. Okay, emergency supplies. Okay, well, we don't have any power, so we need a flashlight. Everybody's got a flashlight. How about a radio, What right? You want to hear about information. You haven't got your cell phone or whatever, so usually you can hear it over the radio. Uh, batteries, that helps. Cash, that helps too, because not many people take credit cards. Um, contact information, who am I gonna call? What's the telephone number? You know, people are all uh, uptight and whatever. I can't remember that number. Yeah, I have those contact informations available. Important papers. Now, what's important papers here? Your driver's license. Uh, anything else you can think of is important passport here? Passport or Right? When I was working overseas, I always had to carry my passport and my visa and whatever. Insurance. What else? Insurance. Insurance, yeah. That's good. Yeah, very good. It's hard to replace some of those things. You know, people are not, are not up in uh, north, they're talking about they've lost all their documents. Who can so, you so, imagine? So security card. Yeah, yeah. everything. Um, okay, here's an important thing. Pet supplies. How many people have even thought about the pet? I know, I know so now I've been was involved with the Erskine fire and the shelters there. We were involved with the fires that they had down at Cottonwood. And then there's a group here that I think they're gonna be talking about here that they help take care of the animals. Uh, but that's an important thing. We have people that bring in their pets. They won't, they'll, they won't go into the shelter, they'll stay out with their pets. Or they make sure they might put themselves in jeopardy to go back in and get their pets if they've left the house, right? So anyways, be sure you have the pets. So in your personnel kit, you have to have to have a backpack or whatever, something that you can pick up that has all that stuff in it to go. Um, three days supply of, uh, per person, and then of course updated uh, whatever you, uh, twice a year or whatever like that. But have that thing available every time. Because how much time did the people have to leave the fire when they were up in uh, up north? Some of them like five minutes. Can you imagine five minutes and you're looking around for all this stuff? Have it in your pack, ready to go. All right, next one. Okay, family supply kit, sheltering in place. If you're gonna stay in your house or you're gonna go to a shelter, particularly in your house, right? Two week supplies. Two week supplies to handle all the people that are in the house. It's a lot of water. Uh, change of clothes, hygiene items, toys and games, books and magazines. Because you know, a lot of the people that move into the uh, shelters, I know when I was up at the, uh, uh, for the Erskine fire, up in the shelters up at uh, 
uh, up north that we had uh, a lot of people would go there, but they didn't have, okay, what do I, how do I keep the kids entertained, right? So I put a few toys in there or whatever or something that can keep them occupied. Okay, next one. Oh, I think somebody talked about this. It's in the middle of the night, right? You got a fire, you gotta get out in a hurry, right? So what do you do? You're in your bed there, and what do you need? You better have these close by, sturdy shoes, because there's gonna be broken glass or whatever, right? Uh, flashlight, that helps. Prescription eyeglasses, oh my gosh, I'm blind if I don't have my glasses, right? I'm kind of moving around here. And then, of course, avoid stepping on the glass and other debris. But have that right by your bed, so that when there's a, there's a disaster, you're ready to go. How many people have this stuff ready to go? Just a few, yeah. I know I didn't have it ready to go until I joined the Red Cross. And then I saw all these disasters and said, ooh, I better get something. Um, okay, some of these things, there's a lot to do, but most of the items you can get at the budget store. Okay, be Red Cross ready. Let's make a plan, okay? Everything is good, but if you haven't got a plan, it's not, it's not worth anything, right? And again, we're talking about the plan here. Let's, uh, next one. So what's the important thing we talked about? House fires. Right? What do we do in house fires? Right. So we want to make you a, what you call an escape plan in your house. Right? You draw your house, you draw the, the rooms and whatever, and they, they talked about it before. What are two ways to get out of the house? The first one, which would be the what? Door. Door, right? Or the second one would be window. the window, right? Right. So what happens, you have a plan, you indicate where the doors and the windows are, and you say, here's my first escape route, the door, and then here's my second route, which is the window. So what we talk about here is two evacuation routes, um, plan for the pets, and um, again, what do, what do you do with the pets? Who's going to take care of the pet? You're running out the door? Oh my gosh, I better make sure I get the pet. Um, two evacuation route, out of state contact, who are you going to call it? It's out of state, if you have to. Um, consider what to do if you're at home or away. You ever gone into somebody's house? I, I do this all the time, maybe because I worked overseas for 20 years. And you go to somebody's house and you say, somebody brought this up before. You look in and it says, what's the escape routes here? And you look at the windows, and right? Sometimes you see, you ever see everybody sees all these bars on the window. How the heck are you ever gonna get out, right? Or the doors are locked, or they're chained or whatever. So any place I go, maybe it's just a, a thing that I have, but I always check wherever I go, either a restaurant, a bar, any place, to make sure the doors are able, you can only get out. If you can't, then I'm always by the door that you get out. I think the fire department is make sure that's the first thing, right? What, how can you get out? Uh, next one. Okay, so what happens, you make a plan and you practice on it, right? Okay, we're gonna have a drill, let's say twice a year or something like that, right? Um, and I think the important part here is this. Once you leave the house, you're going to have to pick her a muster point. So I think here, if we had a fire in this building here, I think we'd have a muster point outside someplace. People meet here. Or if it's in a school, you meet someplace. So in my house here, our muster point is in the, the, across the street with the mailbox. Right? Everybody's going to meet there. So we meet there, and then all of a sudden you said, oh gosh, we have four people in our family, one person's missing. Of course, the fire department comes and they say, oh, hey, is, there any, is everybody here? No, there isn't. There's somebody missing. So then they know, hey, we should go in and check the, uh, the house or whatever like that. And I think it is, too, is that once you guys do get there, is you can make a check around the perimeter exactly. to see if the windows and whatever like that, if anybody's in the windows or if you hear whistles or whatever like that, that's great. So, uh, so have a plan, have a, uh, have a muster point. So what happens when you leave the house? What should you do? If somebody's missing, what would you do? Do not go back in. Oh, yeah. Stay, Stay out. Don't go back in. Because most people that do go back in, what do they succumb to? Is it the heat or is it the smoke? Smoke. Oh. Smoke, yeah, exactly. Wow. So then you're going to be two people down, right? You go back in, now you got two people down instead of one. So now it's twice the work for the fire department. So. Okay, here's a big thing here, and somebody else mentioned about smoke detectors, right? This is a huge problem that the Red, does everybody know that the Red Cross installs smoke detectors? Yeah. Okay, well we have big programs throughout the country where we buy, we go into communities, we uh, knock on the door, and we go in to evaluate how, are there smoke detectors working? If they're not, then we replace them for free. And we've identified that working smoke detectors save lives. We're gonna have a program in, um, uh, Lost, or Kalinga, 
We've had one in Taft, really, and we were going to have one here in Bakersfield. 400 volunteers going to over 900 homes to look at the smoke detectors, right? So we've done a lot of those over the past two years since I've been with it, and we find out it does save water. So if you want to find, if you want to, if you're interested in this, it says, ah, I'm having trouble with these smoke detectors, right? Call the Red Cross, we'll schedule you, we'll come out, take a look at it. If it's not working, we'll replace it for free. Who you need to get a hold of when an emergency happens. Um, here, primarily, we have earthquakes, home fires, floods, um, and heat waves, and wildfires, of course. Um, we have our radio stations. We have um, here, in, uh, yeah, here we do also. Um, we have uh, 1610, F, or in English, 1610, 80, or 89 at 1 FM, 96.1 FM, 1516, or 1560. And then in Spanish, 91, 92.1, and 1490. Um, we have re we reverse 911. Um, this is where they, Get you get give you the information and you find out from them what's going on. We have the um, we have some uh, packets in the back. It'll get, so you can sign up for it. You go online really quick. Give them your information. It's just name, address, and phone number. That way you know what's going on when something happens. And then safe and well, safe and well. You go online. You go on to um, redcross.org slash safe and well. Safe and well. You can go on there and say. Uh, this is my name, and I'm here, and I'm okay. Or you can go on there and look for somebody that if you're there missing, you're looking for your neighbor or a relative, you go on there and hopefully they'll maybe have their name in there too so you can get a hold of them and make sure that they're safe also. Um, always know where your nearest fire station, police station, and hospital are. Um, know your surroundings. You want to make sure that all of your hazardous um, areas are taken well uh, taken care of. You want to make sure everything is bolted to the wall, nothing's going to be falling over or anything like that. Um, know where your water, or gas, and electricity shutoffs are. So um, if you are not around a desk or anything like that, you want to get uh, closest to uh, um, an interior wall. You want to make sure that there's nothing around you that's going to fall on you. Get on your knees and cover your neck and your head. And then eva evacuate the building as soon as the shaking stops. If you're in bed, do the same thing. Don't get under your bed. Make sure you use a try to use a pillow or something like that. Keep your neck and head covered at all times. If you're in the car, pull over to the side of the road, wait for the shaking to stop, and then go on. But you want to make sure that you're pulling over. You're not going to be sliding all around the roads. Um, OK, home fires. So do, does anybody know when the highest uh, rate of home fires occur during the year? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's right. Um, so not only do we have somebody in there cooking, but we have multiple people cooking, multiple different things going on at one time. We're not only paying attention to, we're not only cooking, but we're also paying attention to who else is there and what's going on there. We're socializing, all that kind of stuff. So we want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on what the task at hand is. We want to be safe in that as much as possible. When there's a fire, uh, crawl low, stay out of the smoke. Um, when you go up to a door to exit, you're going to feel the door. If it's hot, if you can't feel that it's, it's hot, feel the crease of the door. And if it's still, you can't, still can't tell, then feel the hand door knob where your uh, emergency exits are. Um, wildfire safety. You guys up here know all this. We're not quite used to this. <laughs> um, uh, so keeping your gutters clear, um, maintaining a defensible space of at least 30 feet from your house, um, pruning your trees, and evacuate early. Uh, how many people in the room have pets? Okay. And how many of you treat your pets as if they were family? Um, I'm not used to uh, having a time limit when I'm talking about pets, so I had to keep some crib notes to keep on point here. Um, how many of you would risk your lives for your pets? A lot of hands there, too. And um, since we have fire and law enforcement represented here, I want you to honestly answer this next question, because they need to know this. How many of you would sneak behind a, or sneak into a, uh, secured evacuation area 
to rescue your pets. Stand on the cliff. I, I would, even though I know it's the wrong thing to do. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, we know from all too many incidents, especially recently, that people will not evacuate their homes unless they can take their pets with them. Uh, so CCAT provides shelters for all types of pets and in close proximity to human shelters so uh, that either the owners can take care of them or they can at least come and walk them and we'll set up a, in, a, in a room like this we'll have cages all around and, and uh, volunteers there to uh, see that they're fed, walked, watered and all their needs are met. Um, hopefully in doing so we're saving human lives by saving animal lives because if we can get you to evacuate that's it. When, when you're told to evacuate it's time to go um, so to help us help you as uh, everyone else has said have a plan and you actually have to have a couple of uh, plans a contingency plan because uh, what if you're at home and you have to evacuate with your pets and your family. Oh great, you can grab their food and you can grab their uh, medicines and, and you can have the luxury of getting everything together. But what happens if uh, you're not at home and your, your home is in an evacuation area and you're not allowed in there? Um, well, do you have your neighbor's phone numbers? Uh, will your dog eat your neighbor's face if they go over and help them? Uh, does your dog or does your neighbor know how to load a horse into a trailer? Uh, there's there's uh, quite a lot of different pets out there, and um, uh, your plan is going to be very unique to your own situation. You, know, you may live in town and have a puppy pretty easy. I live in Old West Ranch and I have horses, goats, pigs, and dogs, and a cat. <laughs> so everybody's plan is going to be a little bit different. Uh, an example of what a plan is not is, well, I'm just going to open the barn doors and let them run. That is not a plan. Even though you, you know, okay, this is what I'm going to do, <coughs> wrong thing to do. Uh, the barn is their safety zone. So if they don't go back into the barn, you're putting them out in, in everyone's uh, harm's way. Yeah, they could run into a, a battalion coming up the road and stampede the battalion. Uh, they, I can't tell you how many people I've seen posting on Facebook, uh, can you help me find my horses? I let them go before the fire and now I don't know if they're alive or dead. Uh, so that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, a good plan would include um, a couple of important notes. Identification. Uh, a lot of small animals come into our shelters without ID tags or collars or anything. Um, if they have a chip, register the chip. I, I adopted a dog and forgot to register the chip on her. I, I, I didn't have it installed, it was already there. But I got the, the code to do it, I need to do that. So, so even us uh, supposed professionals at this, uh, this game are not always totally prepared. Uh, meds, obviously you want to have that in a, in a kit and any special diet foods that, that your pets might be uh, needing. And photos, not only photos of the pet, but photos of the pet with you. Because when you come to the shelter after the uh, incident is over and want to gather your, your pet, you're going to want to be able to prove, prove hey, this is my dog, really. I'm not taking it to a uh, you know, dog fighting uh, event later on. <coughs> so uh, a couple other things about having a plan is what kind of time do you need? I need a lot of time because I got a lot of critters. Uh, so that makes early evacuation uh, a real consideration. Uh, in the last two incidents that had Old West Ranch sweating a little bit, uh, I saw the fire from work and I went into my supervisor and I said, see ya, there's a fire, I gotta go. And I was able to get home in time to have everybody loaded and in trailers and cages and, and ready to go. And um, 
and find out how many holes my plan actually had in it, which, uh, uh, you know, the, the fuel in the uh, pump that I use for my water tank, the, the last thing in my plan was I'm going to spray down the house and we're leaving. And the fuel smelled like varnish and the pump wouldn't start. And then I went to grab the other pickup truck to hook up another trailer to it and it needed a jump start. And so uh, our mantra is prepare, practice, refine, and repeat. Uh, because if, if any of those elements of this grand plan you have uh, aren't in place, the whole thing can just go to, to Swiss cheese. It's just <laughs> so uh, if you have any questions as far as more on uh, what you would want in your kit or uh, anything uh, about our shelters, if you would like to volunteer, if you'd like to send money. My question is, do you know if the Humane Society or the organization have stickers that you can put on your windows or Know how many animals are there. Oh, at work. I, that, those are the greatest thing I've seen. Yes, yeah. and if you are at work uh, and fire personnel comes up, there are stickers that go on your window with, with what type of animal and how many. Uh, I don't know that we have them. I don't have any with me if, if we have them. But uh, Humane Society has them. And I think the um, Have a Heart uh, Thrift Store by Radio Shack, I think they have them. I think they sell those for like a dollar or two as a fundraiser. And I think also that uh, we are going to have some. I just didn't, uh, they haven't come down from Fresno to uh, to bring to any events for them. You're working and but, they come and they don't know you have Yeah. And, and, and cats hide under the bed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure uh, the, the it would captain be. will say that those are uh, the best place to, to keep posted on that is the website, which is very simple. It's ccadt.org. As part of my role as the assistant city manager, I'm the keeper of the plan, um, our city emergency operations plan. And that, that plan <coughs> is voluminous. It's uh, two volumes, actually, uh, and it's hundreds of pages. But most of what's in there is forms. Because uh, what, what, what does a governor like better than forms, right? Um, it's kind of an internal joke. Uh, but we always have a form for that. Right? Um, so uh, that plan tells us what to do in the event of an emergency. Uh, it, it gives us a structure to work through so that when it goes down, as we joke about, uh, but, but quite seriously, uh, it's, it's effectively a checklist. And it says, here's the group at the city that's our crisis action team. And here's what they're supposed to do uh, when we hear about an impending disaster when we know when it's just occurred uh, or emergency. And, and here's where we're going to group up. And here's how we're going to organize ourselves. And it's all based upon um, principles that were developed largely after 9-11, right? 9-11 changed emergency management and disaster response in this country fairly significantly. Uh, there were some presidential directives that, that came out after 9-11 about standardizing emergency management throughout the country. Um, and that's what I wrote my master's thesis on. That's why Keith's saying I'm an expert. I'm not an expert at all. In fact, who here learned something new tonight? Oh, gosh. Okay, so did I, right? I, first off, I'd never heard of a, a vial of life. Is that what you call it? That's super cool. I've never heard of that before. Uh, I also didn't know the Red Cross installed smoke alarms for folks. Uh, that was news to me. Um, so if, if we learned one thing tonight, I think that's fantastic. So a big thank you to everybody that's participated thus far. I'm, I, in my presentation, I was kind of broad because I don't want to talk a lot about what we do because quite frankly, what we do won't impact you directly in a disaster uh, in the same way that what you can do will impact you directly in a disaster, right? And that's, we've heard that theme a lot tonight. Um, but from a city standpoint, we have 59 full-time employees. Uh, about 22 of those are in public works. Uh, we have 14 or 15 police officers, and the rest are people like me that sit in an office, right? And in the disaster, I'm not gonna be the one out, probably, rescuing you from a down, you know, from a collapsed building or uh, pulling you out of a mudslide. That's what our fantastic fire personnel and our police personnel and other emergency responders are gonna be doing. Um, and what we're gonna be doing is trying to coordinate those resources. 
working with the county emergency operations center, working with the state, uh, and all the other resources that begin to flow in in the middle of a disaster, our, our role is really at the city to help coordinate those. Uh, in addition to our, our first responders, which are public works and police, uh, who will be out clearing roads, reestablishing utility services, uh, trying our, our absolute darndest to protect public safety and all those things. Um, a lot of what's been talked about tonight, I do have some forms I printed out. These are from ready.gov. I'm going to talk a little bit about ready.gov. Uh, it's a FEMA website. Um, I hate printing all this stuff too because it's all available electronically, but not everybody's really tech savvy. And frankly, if you take something like this home, you might stick it on your fridge, you might not do something about it today or tomorrow or even two weeks from now, you might see it and go, you know what, maybe I will make a kit because I have this. But if I tell you to go home and look on the internet and you don't do it right away, there's a pretty good chance you'll forget. So these forms are, um, like I said, these come directly from ready.gov. There's a family communication plan. We talked a lot about the importance of communication. Uh, there's an emergency supply list. Uh, this, these are extensive, but it basically covers everything uh, that's already been talked about tonight. There is a um, preparing for pet owners flyer, double-sided, some good information on there and ideas. And then there's a basic emergency supply kit. It's really abbreviated. Um, but if you could just do that, uh, we'd all be better off. Because um, again, what I'm going to do in the 24 and 48, 72 hours after a significant emergency is probably not going to impact you directly. It just isn't. There's too few of us and there's too many of you. And while we may be able to get water back to you, um, depending on the nature of what's happened, even establishing, reestablishing clean water services probably won't happen right away. Uh, my dad was in Hurricane Rita. Not a lot of people remember Hurricane Rita. It's right after Hurricane Katrina. It's the same year. Um, it was actually a stronger hurricane. It did a significant amount of damage. We got a little less coverage because it wasn't quite as, the, the pictures on TV weren't as dramatic. Um, but my parents lived in a rural area, used to, uh, in East Texas, and they were out of power for almost two months. Almost two months it took to get utility services reestablished. Um, I hate to tell you this because it makes my profession look really bad, but the city manager didn't show back up after he came to the end of town. Uh, he basically called the, the city council and said, you might as well cut me my last check because I'm not coming back. Um, that's not going to happen here. But um, the point is, even though we hope we can get to you in 72 hours, we can get, we can help get utility services reestablished. We can help get major transportation routes reestablished. There's a there's a very realistic chance that that's not going to happen in a in a large scale emergency. So uh, I just want to clip through a few things. I have some statistics because I like statistics and I think they're, they're interesting and they help paint a picture. Um, I also have a video. I'm going to skip the video. Um, it's only a few minutes long, but the sound, we had some sound issues with the presentation, and, and, um, but it's on YouTube, um, it's all over the internet. This was a video they put out uh, in 2008, if I remember right, but when they did the first Great California Shakeout, and it kind of walks through in four or five minutes um, all the things they learned as they were studying what would happen in the event of a large magnitude earthquake uh, on the San Andreas Fault, down <laughs> south towards the Salton Sea. How would that earthquake travel up through Southern California? What kind of damage would it do? Um, there's hundreds of thousands of people that live and work on different sides of the San Andreas Fault, right? Um, they travel across the San Andreas Fault to go to work, and then they have to come back across it to go home. So if that happens during the workday, how are they gonna get home, right? All these different things. Billions of dollars in damage, um, hundreds of thousands of people injured, 1,600 fires raging, all these things, right? It's, it's kind of scary. Uh, and that's usually why I include it in a presentation because I want to try and scare you to be prepared. Uh, but it's also very realistic. The, the Great California Shakeout, the first one, um, and what's been built into now the Great American Shakeout, uh, was, it was based on a ton of research done by the USGS and scientists and professors and all these really smart people, way smarter than me. Uh, trying to trying to get a better idea of what really is going to happen in that particular disaster scenario. Uh, and of course all that changes if the earthquake happens down by the Salton Sea, or if it happens up closer to the Central Valley or whatever, but at least it gives you an idea. 
We already talked about this too. How are you going to cope without access to electricity, natural gas, gasoline, food, all these different things that you rely on every day that you don't even think about? And um, how are you going to communicate? How are you going to keep your family safe? Every year there's about uh, 500 earthquakes that occur in the state of California um, that are large enough to be felt by someone. I find that hard to believe though because I've lived in California for 12 years, I've never felt an earthquake. <laughs> So I'm a little disappointed about that. Um, I've been through hurricanes. Uh, I, I sat in a tropical storm that dumped 18 inches of rain in 24 hours. You want to talk about uh, excitement? Um, but, but I never felt an earthquake. Hope you don't. I need to, honestly. I, I, I say that in jest. I'm, I'm glad that in 12 years I'm living in California that I haven't felt an earthquake yet. Uh, the 1952 earthquake in Tatchby was the seventh strongest California quake in recorded history, but it's the second largest in the last 100 years. So Tatchby has the potential for a major earthquake, right? It's obviously happened once before, so it could happen again. Um, according to CAL FIRE, there were 3,231 uh, wildfire incidents in 2015. Um, that, was the, that was the most recent year I could find on the CAL FIRE website. Um, in, in the West Fire in Tehachapi in 2010, 50 structures were destroyed and 1,658 acres burned. Um, oh, I got a couple of duplicate stats here. Anyway, um, in 2013, there were actually almost 10,000 wildfire incidents. Uh, and I had a really awesome map that I forgot to include in here that shows all the different wildfire incidents. Basically what it shows you, there's little pins for the, you know, the whole state. And uh, you can't really see the state of California because of so many. Um, but um, in the 2011 Canyon Fire, 62 structures were destroyed and 14,585 acres burned, according to Cal Fire. Um, as of today, I, I went to the Cal Fire website and added up the number of acres that currently burned in the Napa, Sonoma County area and the, the various fires. There's several different fires burning up there if you don't already know. But it's, they've already burned approximately 160,000 acres. That was, that was what I added up today. Just for a point of reference, the Greater Tatchby specific plan area, that's a county planning term, but it's basically what we refer to as Greater Tatchby area. Um, Stallion, Bear Valley, Cummings Valley, Mountain Meadows, Golden Hills. Uh, not quite out to San Canyon, but a whole lot of area out in the mountains to the north. Uh, it's about 176,000 acres. So just kind of the scale of what we're talking about up north. It's pretty significant. And so what are our hazards, right? These are kind of the five, what we consider probably our five most likely hazardous events. Um, obviously, we don't have hurricanes on here, right? Um, but earthquake, wildfire, train derailment. We haven't talked about that, but there's been a, there's been a number of train derailments in Tashby in the last few years. And, and as our fire captain, was fire captain was talking about, some of those cars are carrying some pretty nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. We've been fortunate that the trains that derailed didn't, didn't vent off gases and things that are going to, unfortunately, blow this direction, right? Because those train derailments are happening to the west, and the prevailing winds are blowing all of that back this way, right? Thankfully, our fire department has that covered. Uh, they have some really fascinating technology that can predict plumes and how those how those uh, gas plumes will travel and and uh, can can do some great notifications to help get people aware of that. But those are things that can happen here. Severe weather. We know all about severe weather, right? We've seen mudslides. And mudslides. I don't think anybody ever imagined could happen here. And, and when you watch the videos and you see the aftermath, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and then public health disasters. Those are things we haven't really talked about yet. Um, but are you prepared to deal with a public health emergency? Um, you know, every, every year there's a new flu that's going to kill everyone, right? Um, thankfully that hasn't really happened yet. Although I did get the swine flu once and that was pretty bad. Uh, but you know, every year there's some new public health potential emergency and we haven't talked a lot about that, but are you prepared to deal with those? Um, and a lot of what you're going to have to do is stay at home, right? Not interact with the public. Well, how can you help each other if we, if we don't want to try and spread disease, right? So what are we doing at the city? Um, just a couple of things. There's other things that we do, but we're, we're partnering with the county. The county's initiating a new multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. I'll try to say that fast. Um, it's an update of an existing plan that we participated in over the last uh, decade or so. 
But the idea, in short, is to identify what are the possible hazards specific to your community and what can you do in the coming years to mitigate those hazards. Um, you know, a good example are things like flood control structures. We know there are areas that are prone to flooding, and, and can we create physical improvements or, or uh, construct physical improvements to help mitigate the potential for a significant uh, event or emergency due to flooding? That's, that's the kind of things that we'll be working on with the county uh, on that multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. That actually is kicking off right now. Um, and so we'll have, you know, over the course of the next year, be updating that plan together. We also do building code compliance. Um, California learned a lot of bad lessons about unreinforced masonry. Um, you know, a lot of buildings used to be built with bricks stacked on top of each other and stuck together with mortar. But in an earthquake, that doesn't hold together very well. Uh, this building was actually unreinforced masonry. You'd think that'd be a bad place to put a police station. Um, but when we bought it, one of the things that we did was wrap it in a fiberglass mesh. Uh, this is designed to withstand bunker bombs, uh, but it'll also hold the, the masonry structures together in the event of an earthquake. That's because of building code compliance. Those building codes, while they can be frustrating when you want to go build a new patio cover or, uh, or swap out your water heater, now you have to add straps to it, right? Those building codes are there to help keep your home or your business uh, or the structures that you have and, and depend on in one piece in an emergency. So it's a big part of what we do. Um, again, well, we have an emergency operations plan. Again, that's, that's how we deal with an emergency at the city. Um, we update that biannually. Uh, we also have our in-house in dispatch center. When we first started the police department, we contracted dispatch with Bear Valley, and that was a great partnership for us. Um, but at some point, it kind of made more sense for us to have our own dispatch center. We built this building with that in mind, and, and our dispatchers are sitting there. If you walk out through the lobby, you'll see them. Um, and now we have folks in-house that we can talk to via radio and help coordinate uh, our activities locally in the event of an emergency that we have control over. We've also built expanded water storage. Um, we have a significant amount of water storage. We have a large tank up above High Line. We have several large tanks um, off of Curry Street. Uh, and we can store enough water in there, at least for a few days, um, unless we're in the heat of the summer, to, to have clean water. And those tanks are designed with standard earthquakes as well. Uh, and then we also have the Nixil emergency notification system. So Key mentioned that a little bit uh, earlier tonight. It's, it's a way for us to reach out to you in the event of a major emergency or through or in minor emergencies too. Uh, when we set up traffic control to deal with an accident in town and those kinds of things, we can send out emergency alerts and we can do that via telephone, text message, and email. And it's super simple to sign up. So if you have a cell phone and you want to sign up for Nixil alerts, you just text 93561 to 888-777, and it'll automatically set up your phone number that way. You can also go to nixel.com and put your information in that way to get emergency alerts from the city. Kern County has a similar system uh, called ReadyKern. You can go to readykern.com. Really easy to really easy to find. Um, you can also just go to the Kern County Fire website, and right on that homepage is a ReadyKern link. Uh, and you can do the same thing. You can sign up to receive emergency alerts uh, via text message, email, and phone calls. And I'm not gonna cover a whole lot of this because it's been talked about already, but the one thing that we really wanna impress upon everyone is be informed. Understand what's out there, what hazards exist. Make a plan for your family, for yourself. How are you going to communicate? Where are you going to go if you have to evacuate? How are you going to evacuate? All those things. Make a plan and then practice that plan. And then build a kit. Ready.gov is a great resource. That's where we got the, the forms from we passed around. Uh, but there's so much other information there. Um, ready for you to come and learn. and You can learn about every possible type of disaster. If you want to learn about uh, nuclear attacks or biological or chemical weapons, you can learn about that there too. Hopefully we never have to deal with that here. Um, but you can learn about the things that we do have a like, likelihood of having to deal with, like wildfires and earthquakes and, and uh, so on and so forth. 
there's, there's lots of information in there about how to build a plan. So I gave you a form, but there's, there's some steps that you might want to walk through. There's some things you might want to consider as you put that plan together. You can do that at ready.gov. So put together a plan and, and start by discussing these kind of questions. How am I going to get emergency alerts and warnings? What's my shelter plan? What's my evacuation route? What's my family and household communication plan? Consider the specific needs of your household, right? Everybody's different. And so I knew that uh, the Red Cross was going to talk about some of the specifics about uh, the same, same kinds of things that, uh, that I was going to talk about tonight. But I wanted to cover, um, wanted to remind you that everybody's unique. You, you have different ages in your household, right? I've got little kids. I've got a baby under the age of, uh, well, he's 12 months old. Um, his needs are going to be dramatically different than my 11-year-old, right? Um, and he doesn't eat regular food like we do. I mean, he kind of does. But I'm not sure he's going to eat a power bar. If that's what I'm planning to eat in an emergency. And, and, and literally, a lot of people, you'll see, if you buy a 72-hour kit, and I'll show you one of those in a minute, if you buy one, it's not coming with mac and cheese and, uh, and, and hot dogs and all that stuff. It's like a... It's a kind of a nasty little bar, but it's going to taste fine. I don't know what's going to keep you alive. It's not going to taste fine. It's going to keep you alive. Um, but he's not going to eat that, right? So how am I going to prepare to deal with him in the event of an emergency? So everybody's different. Um, when you're developing your plan, do you have a responsibility to assist others? Do you have a family member that has um, you know, special needs? Or do you have an elderly family member that that's not as mobile as you, or that requires oxygen, or those kinds of things. And, and if you have that responsibility right now, then you should expect to have that responsibility in a disaster as well. Um, dietary needs. Um, if you have allergies, um, don't, don't buy a kit without looking at what's in that kit first, because you might not want to eat what's in that power bar if you've got some specific allergies. Um, your medical needs, prescriptions, and again, things like oxygen and those, those types of issues. Um, all, one of the things my, my dad told me after Rita was the one mistake he made. He was, he's a leader at our, at our local church, and, and they told some of the members of the congregation, look, if you need to stay, we're going to have the church open. And what he said afterwards is that was a huge mistake. Not, not encouraging those folks to evacuate. Was a, was a huge mistake. Uh, because when they showed up at the church with an oxygen bottle in tow, they realized really quickly, we're not going to be able to help these people if there's a significant issue. Uh, so if you have those medical needs and you can't evacuate in the event of some kind of emergency, don't stay home. Uh, and encourage your neighbors and your family members not to stay home either. Um, again, disabilities. Is there a language barrier? Um, do you know folks that have a language barrier that might live near you that, that may not be able to get emergency notifications in the same way? Are there any cultural or religious considerations? Do you have pets or service animals? Uh, and again, household, households with school-aged kids, if your kids are at school and something happens, how are you going to deal with that? Um, so fill out your family emergency evacuation plan and practice that plan. Uh, a great time to do that the way we do it at my house is when we change the clocks, right? So that happens twice a year. We spring forward and then we fall back, right? And so there's a pretty good even distance between those things. That's when we change our batteries and our smoke alarms, and that's when we practice our emergency plan with the kids. Um, could we do it more often? Yeah, probably, right? Could you over-prepare? Sure. Although it, it makes for really good TV if you watch Doomsday, Doomsday <laughs> Preppers, right? Um, <laughs> But, but at a minimum, try and do it twice a year. My suggestion is when the, clock, when the time changes. Right? It's an easy way to remember. So again, you can buy a 72-hour kit. Right? This will probably keep you alive for 72 hours. And it's a nice, and it's a nice cool backpack. And you can throw it in your car if you had to leave. Uh, there's some boxed water. And there's some, some funky power bar type things. Or there's this kind of 72-hour kit. Right? This is what mine looks like. And I bought it. I have go bags, right? If I had to grab a bag and go, I've got go bags for me and my kids and my wife uh, and my dog. And those I can throw in the car, but those aren't going to get me by for more than a day, really. It's just an extra change of clothes, a pair of shoes, some snacks for the kids, and some coloring books. Hopefully we don't need more than that if we have to take off. Um, but if I'm going to stay at home, 
So I'm going to eat some real food, or at least I'm going to try to. Canned food, non-perishable items, uh, and those things need to be rotated. They don't last forever, right? Um, but you can get some rubber-made totes. And frankly, if I had to grab them and go and I had a little bit more time, I've got four rubber-made totes. I can get those into my car myself, and we can, and we can get out the door, maybe not quite as quickly, uh, but we can still do that. So this is the easy way. You just pay the money and it shows up at your house and it will work just fine, but so does this, right? What matters is, did you take the time to prepare? Did you take the time to think through what you needed? Did you take the time to make a kit, at least to the best of your ability to address your needs in, in the at least 72 hours immediately after um, an emergency? So that was all I wanted to cover tonight. I didn't want to go into a whole lot of detail, um, specifically about how are you going to prepare, because what I really want to impress upon everyone is to get informed, Make a plan, build a kit. And there's so many good resources out there we've already heard from tonight. The Red Cross, the CERT teams. Um, there's electronic resources. They're out there everywhere. Uh, and if we can just encourage people to be a little bit more prepared, it's going to benefit everybody in the disaster. Because I won't have to worry as much about the more people that are prepared and that are not coming to my dispatch center and trying to take resources from us being able to turn on clean water and reopen critical transportation routes and those kinds of things, the better off I'm going to be in an emergency. Uh, so if we can get people prepared uh, and encourage people to be prepared, we'll all be better off. So thank you so much for coming tonight.